everybody. Welcome to San Diego Comic-Con virtual. Um, this is the world building virtual panel with Image Comics. My name is Marla Isaac. I'm the executive assistant at Image Comics. And we have a bunch of creators here that are going to talk to us about world building. Um, so I guess I'll just introduce everyone. We have Kieran Gillen. He's working on the Ludocrats. Uh, w. Maxwell Prince, he's working on a new book coming out called Ha Ha, and also Ice Cream Man. Uh, Sanford Green on uh, Bitterroot, <laughs> Stephanie Hans on Die, and Mirko Gandolfo on uh, Mercy, and also on Natural. How's it going, everybody? You doing okay? Nice. <laughs> yeah. It's, this, it's going. It's going. It's going. It's uh, it's quite a bit different doing these instead of Comic Cons in person. I don't know. Um, I'm I'm okay with the panels. I don't know about you guys. I like being around all the people at Comic Con. It gets to be a little much, but at least there's people around. I don't know. It's gonna be very strange without it. Yeah, I think I think at this point, I I don't typically like being around that many people but i would yeah. i'd take it i'd take whatever i could get at this point I know. <laughs> yeah same i know our booth is usually pretty hectic but even seeing a lot of the fans come up would be that would be okay right now i'd be okay with that i miss conventions very very much it's mm -hmm. also you know I, I was talking with a, um a friend just uh, earlier who's a cosplayer I was like, when is the next time we'll be able to get full dressed on to go to a convention? Yeah. Yeah. And like, that's a lot of people's jobs too. It's, I mean, and obviously your guys' jobs, yeah. like selling books at conventions, that's huge. So yeah, it's a lot different. I have a slightly different take on this. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it mm -hmm. to some degree because I clean out my garage for the first time in 10 years. Wow. <gasps> So clean. It's so clean right now that I, I'm, I'm thinking about making that my studio, my wow. secondary studio. Um, <laughs> I cleaned out my, my storage shed. <laughs> All wow. the places that needed to be utilized for the original purposes, I can now do. Like oh, my, my garage, amazing. I can put my car in there now. <laughs> storage shed, I can, I, it's, I can walk in and everything is neatly you know, stacked. And my next job is tackling my studio here. So wow. I'm going to try my best to feel good about this, at least for the next two months. Yeah. Because uh, I got, I had projects laid out for the next two months. Mm -hmm. um, painted my, my, my living room and my kitchen. Dang. So, yeah. <laughs> <Been busy. laughs> Just the only way I can stay uh, sane um, at this moment. That and draw. Yeah, <clears throat> I get that. Yeah, I've been writing a lot. And I have a, a cabinet in my kitchen that was just full of grocery bags. So I cleaned that out <laughs> and it was very satisfying because it looked crazy. <laughs> after, after this panel, I will show you a trick of how to consolidate those. Ooh. I learned it from my, my, my sister-in-law. It's, it's fascinating how you, it's the way you fold them. You can put like a thousand of those little, those plastic bags in like a space. <laughs> like, yeah. It's insane. Ooh. I'm sorry. This is, this is my life now. No, it's okay. It's all our <laughs> lives now. <laughs> we're, we're building our world. <laughs> exactly. Good segue. If we're doing our tips, we had a, <laughs> we had a couple, me and my wife, we had a week sort of off. Like we've basically been doing this since like end of January. So it's been oh, relentless and endless. So we had a quote unquote holiday week and we did everything we could to make it feel different. And I made tea in the wrong mugs. So, cause everyone always has the same mug. So I was deliberately giving people slightly different mugs, Ooh. which, you know, rejuvenated the whole experience. <laughs> oh, no. Really switching it up, really getting crazy there. <laughs> really getting intense. <laughs> Party animal. Uh, um, well, I guess segueing into world building, especially right now, what is the most helpful for you in terms of inspiration with the worlds that you'll, you're building right now, the series you're working on? What do you go back to for inspiration? <laughs> well, my book is based on fighting hate. So 
I just go on the internet. Yeah, just go on Twitter. Just go on Twitter. <laughs> go on Twitter yeah. And um, get get uh, get all the information or all the inspiration I can handle, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if inspiration, negative inspiration. I don't know. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I I mean, kind of to that same point. It's it's had the, whereas it might you know, um, like Sanford's book kind of directly addresses that stuff. It's been there's also this sense that it's kind of overwhelming that it's hard to, to write just like a, you know, your normal book when all this stuff is going on and you want to pay attention to, to the world around you and kind of be reading a lot more and understanding um, what's going on outside of your, your house. So I, I've, I've, I've had a very hard time writing and staying focused uh, over the past, certainly since the pandemic started, just, you know, because of space and the changes and then, you know, as um, things escalated with, with the protests in the past couple of weeks, wanting to, you know, keep your finger on the pulse and get involved when you can. It's just, there hasn't mm -hmm. been a ton of, ton of mental room for like sitting down and saying, oh, like, how can I make an interesting story? Right. Yeah, it was the same for me. Like I, I couldn't focus for the whole time of the lockdown. Here in France, it's finished. Like uh, I can go and work. At, I I have an office outside, so I can work with friends and or just colleagues, and it really helps me a lot. Just I'm going there. I'm focusing. Uh, I you know, eat with people and just makes a, a normal day, kind of normal day. And mm -hmm. but as long as I was inside, I was I was. I was cleaning too. I was doing yoga and bread, just like everybody. <laughs> also in Italy, same situation. Uh, also in Italy now we can go outside. In the I'm I'm back in the office with my friends. Same situation okay. exactly, and it is better, so better compared yes. to some time ago when we was at home. Uh, also, my studio at home is terrible compared to the office. So I'm really happy to be in, uh, finally free to go to the office, obviously with the masks and everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, still being safe, but working through it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm similar. Like, I think, I don't think anybody, I mean, people either, I think I'm working about 80%. Like, and I don't know anyone who's doing more than 80% of what they're doing. Like, I've got friends who've done zero. In fact, perhaps even negative. Like they're sort of mm -hmm. setting fire, you know, it's, it's a lot. I mean, I'm in the position where like for the last three months, I'd actually done a load of planning beforehand. So I actually got my big, like I knew where I was going next, you know, the, the full next arc of Die, the full next arc of all the other books I write. Mm -hmm. And I'd basically just been writing them. So it's like that kind of big, hard, creative thinking was done. And so I've just basically been like a marathon, just kept, keep on tapping and like you'll polish up eventually. And I'm actually right now, I've actually hit the end of all of that. So I'm kind of forcing with, I'm having to actually go back and try to generate new ideas again. And that's hard, you know, that's yeah. kind of like, um, I'm sitting here and like riffing through, you know, doing my usual sort of research method and seeing what inspires me. And it's coming together. And yeah. it's kind of coming together, as of Sanford was saying, there's a lot of anger here right now. <laughs> so I'm like taking like a lot of the anger I've got towards various things that's happening in the world and putting it into the work. But that's mm -hmm. kind of like, if you're well building, it's always that Nova idea, and then it builds and builds and becomes a, a larger thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how each of you do research and how that kind of plays into um, inspiration. Uh, Mirka, especially with, um, with Mercy, I grew mm -hmm. up in Washington State. I don't know if Woodsburg is a real place, but did you did you take that and kind of or take a place that's similar to that and just kind of make up your own world with it? Uh, it's, no, I just invented this city, yeah, this town, town. just mm -hmm. completely invented, uh, just in inspired from some movies I see, uh, I saw, I saw, um, horror, gothic, uh, stuff like that. I really like that kind of atmosphere. And also from video games, I play a lot of video games. And, oh, interesting. Uh, horror stuff uh, that's my favorite uh, team at the moment that's what you go back to often interesting is is lady helene based off of a real person or did you also just make her up too 
no, no, not a real person, not a real person. Oh, Maybe sometimes when I'm angry, angry or angry, I'm when angry. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she looks like me when I'm uh, very, very evil. And yeah, yeah, mm. that's it. Like an ugly girl. <laughs> Don't make me angry or hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Kieran, for Ludocrats, for inspiration or for research, I guess, did you also just like take a bunch of acid? Because that's kind of what I was thinking when I was reading. Oh, I, I wouldn't just limit myself to acid. You know, there's a whole <laughs> Ludocrats would not, you know, Ludocrats does not recommend one drug. It just kind of recommends mm. recombining all, all of forms of uh, chemicals into uh, some kind of exciting cocktail. And, uh, yeah see what works for you you know you've yeah, got to you find your own kind of mix um uh <laughs> ludicrous is weird because it's ludicrous is almost the opposite it's like me and jim like back literally back in 2003 we did this kind of uh, an exquisite corpse as in we wrote letters to each other in character mm. <clears throat> and the entire core of the ludicrous plot as much as it is <clears throat> comes from that in terms of me and him just trying to make each other laugh and throwing so many ideas on the page and that's kind of more the way that Ludogratz even works now. We, we take stuff and we go with, um, like, Jeff and <clears throat> Tamra mm -hmm. and build. You know, it's like the improv rule, always say yes. Uh, but also don't contradict anything that's already happened. So there's a lot of, like, Ludogratz is kind of like you build the balls together and it becomes this amorphous blob. And it's, it's quite exciting. It's very fertile. As opposed to, like, die. And die is like, you know... Mm. I've, lit I've lost count how many books I've read for Dye. It's well over 50, I think, by now. You know what I mean? And Dye's like the, hello, I'm going to pretend to be Alan Moore. Whilst Ludocrats is, I'm going to pretend to be down the pub with some of my best friends. Stephanie, did you, do you feel like that's kind of similar for you? For, for, I don't know how much like research you would need to do for Dye. Or like, was there something that you return to to kind of get your headspace into just die as opposed to other projects um well for die so Karen comes with uh ideas that are uh in the same time uh sharp but vague enough that i have room to improve you know uh he knows what he wants but he doesn't know which shape it should be and um, and for me it's like it's like when you ask an artist to draw a cat you know like a cat any cat and no uh, there won't be two artists drawing the same cat but for them it's the cat and for me each time he, he asks me to draw something for me just it's like oh this is what he wants but i don't really know if this is what he had in his mind but for me it just makes sense oh, yeah. and, and, and this is also the way I keep it coherent because for me, it always makes sense. And as long as it makes sense, I can make it work together. That makes sense. But I, I have a lot of uh, background in uh, a lot of unuseful book to this day until now, you know? Yeah. A uh, lot of um, books from, uh, oh, do you know the Men at Arms series from Osprey? <laughs> Load of them. Oh, I shouldn't do that. I have loads of them. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Good effort, Selene. Sorry, uh, I'm afraid. The can's been open. Okay. Edit, 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 edit. <laughs> right here, Fitz. Okay. <laughs> French people swear all the time. <laughs> you got to do it. <laughs> yeah. That, so do you, do you find yourself returning to that series a lot then? Like, yes, of course. Like, uh, it's the, you know, uh, I used to have a lot of them when I used to play uh, a role playing games because, you know, I, I was always drawing, sketching the characters we, we used. And so Men at Arms is a very, very documented series about Men at Arms uh, from any, any period of time. And so I just had a lot of them. And the illustrators from this series, they are incredible. So it mm. just uh, feed my Im Im imagination for a very long time. Yeah. It you know, it really, yeah, it just mixes in your head. And once you have to draw something, suddenly it just all comes back. Yeah. Sanford, is that the same for you? Do you get, ever go back to a series or a character that you like for inspiration? Um, truth be told, our, our um, series with so much of the historical nature um, 
aspect of it, we we had to do a lot of research on that um, front. Um, yeah. Man, Google has been. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've been um, just uh, camping out on, um, you know, different um, historical sites. Um, you know, from that time period, um, mm -hmm. everything from, um, you know, the you know New York Times articles um, from that time period. Um, there's a <clears throat> actually there's a there's a New York Times article that just came out um, about three months ago, which is interesting enough with everything where it is right now in the state of not only just um, this country, but the world is called the 1619 Project. Mm, and yeah, yeah. I started doing a deep dive into that and looking at the, 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 just how the systemic nature of this country even started to form back in 1619. So we started to, you know, a bit of a spoiler, we're using some of that material to build into future stories that we're doing. Um, and um, we, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. It's a, a little um, uh, liberating to some degree because we were talking about these things, not realizing that there was a project being implemented, a 1619 project being implemented. Um, um, and then when that came out, uh, it was it was like, oh, wow, we're kind of, it, it just helped confirm some of the things that we were yeah. you know, aspiring to do. Um, and then, of course, just, um, you know, um, with the, uh, the Tulsa, um, we did a lot of research on the Tulsa um, um, bombings. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it is real heavy stuff, but it was stuff that we thought was necessary because we got this, this economy of the Harlem Renaissance, which is vibrant and, and, mm. and lush and, and prosperous, if you will. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to show also, which is really fascinating because it's all history, how these extremely dark moments in history <sighs> transcended, you know, into that prosperous moment because all those things happened prior to and yet still this prosperous moment of um, of um, the Harlem Renaissance still occurred even after all those heavy um, mm. moments. So in doing that research, we thought it would re be really uh, advantageous to be able to implement a lot of that stuff into um, our stories. And then, you know, of course, now just with current, you know, um, events, um, it's, 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 it's even to some degree, it's, it's, it's a little bit of um, it's a challenge because things happen, you know, currently that we're if we're not careful, we can be a little too influenced by because yeah. things that we're discovering and we're we might be on one track going in another direction, and then we get this information or something may have happened currently that we're like, oh, we we have to speak on this. This is this is you know yeah. important. And so it's like, okay, how do you find that balance of staying on course, but yet still staying, you know, in, 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 in kind of highlighting some of those things that we feel are very um, prominent um, current. Yeah. That's actually a question that I had for everybody. How do you kind of separate what is happening in front of you, the, the timeliness of, of our current events, and how do you how do you get that to not influence your story too much, or do you let it influence your story in building your world? Do you think that it's important to kind of weave those current events into your story as it is, or do you try to separate yourself from that? Well, I know that you did your your quarantine comics, but like for Ice Cream Man, beyond that, um, are you are you kind of thinking about like current events in terms of the next few issues? Kinda, but not. Well, it's it's there's uh, a kind of a, a multi-pronged answer. Uh, um, the the first is that I think we're likely winding up Ice Cream Man soon, so the the plans for it are um, uh, kind of separate from the the current moment. You know, because mm. we're just kind of thinking of 
how to fit in the last four issues and kind of bring it to a close. Mm -hmm. um, but because of like the one shot nature of Ice Cream Man, there is room to, you know, insert some of that stuff. Uh, my book is maybe a little bit different in that so much of it is about, um, it's a very uh, cerebral um, internal book. It's about, you know, what people, what your work, learn about what's happening external to you and more what's happening uh you know inside your it will the, the mm. everything that's going on right now will make its way into ice cream man but it's maybe not in such a uh, maybe in a more oblique way um yeah because you know a lot of it's about like you know how how do people wrap their heads around um suffering and unfairness and disparity and their own roles in these things and and the the call to change and stuff like that it's um it's it's a balance you have to strike, but yeah, I, ha I have to imagine the next few issues of Ice Cream Man will reflect that to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kieran, is that something? I mean, you already have everything planned out. Sounds like so you're you're pretty set. It's not really that anything. I mean, I mean, if you speak in general, I must admit, with something like Die, I've immediately started thinking, is there going to be a Die Two or something? Mm -hmm. And I'm like. Especially at the moment, I mean, Ludocrats is about imagination. But what is imagination for? What do we do with it? How, you know, and how joyous? And how is our imagination shortened by the world we live in? Whilst Die is about escapism. And, you know, like, escapism has been incredibly close at home for the last, you know, what price escapism, you know, and what are the ethics of escapism, I guess. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a quote from Tolkien I, dig out, I dug out about, a lot of people talk negatively about escapism, and he says, they are confusing the escape of a deserter with the escape of a prisoner, or vice versa. The other point being is in they're not running from the front lines of a war. They're tra you know they're trapped in a hellish place and they want to out of it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so that all those I must admit the current situation and everything is sort of focused my attention a little, I guess, even more. But um, speaking generally, you cannot escape the oxygen you're breathing. Like I, I think people who try to make the, the world not influence them, they're kind of deluded because <laughs> it's like it's just there, you know. It's like and the I mean. The book I'm doing over at Boom is very clearly about Brexit, you know, the, uh, you know, and I, I, you can't help the fact, in fact, even historically speaking, you go back and look at Dostoevsky or whatever, and like, we take this as classic literature, of all timeless literature, and you know, Dostoevsky is riffing on uh, critiques of enlightenment and whatever, you know, like, all these, you know, you're always, and even if you try to not write at the time, you're, you're still writing on the, the prejudices yeah. and the ideas of the time and the, and the spirit of the age, mm -hmm. so like, it's always going to be there, so I kind of just relax into it. Yeah, it's impossible to totally separate it because you're living in it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and not everything is original, so you're you're always kind of building off of somebody else's inspiration. Stephanie, do there's you only know? twenty amino acids. You know, actually, how many amino acids are there? However, amino acids they are, everything's built out of that. You know, like yeah, there's only so many outcomes that could come from that. Um, I guess one other question that I had was. How do you take a, just a germ of an idea into a world? You start with this idea or even like an image or, or, or anything, like a, a bit of a song or like a painting or something, and it turns into like a whole world. So how do you, for you personally, I, I'm curious what your techniques are for building that out into a bigger world, into a bigger story. Um, Mark, I, we can start with you if you want. Yes. Uh, when I create something, I always start, uh, maybe strange, I don't know. I always start with the character. Mm. And then I, my, my first uh, idea comes from the main character, from her, in this case, from Mercy. Uh, her um, mood, her uh, way of thinking. I, I'm not sure, sorry, my English is terrible. And uh, after that, uh, I try to create something uh, around her. It comes out very naturally, to be honest. It's like, uh, I know it sounds very cliche, but it's like uh, the character tells me the story. Mm. When I create a character and I'm very focused on the character, uh, it's easy, it comes very naturally in my mind uh, to create something around her around the uh, hair um, targets uh, 
uh, I also put sometimes uh, something of my um, my personality sometimes mm. character and uh, for example Lady Elaine from Mercy she's very cold I'm not always cold but sometimes I have this this part of myself and uh, it's in the character yeah in the natural it was another kind of character uh, of um, personality and in all my comics I try to do that mm, character first that's interesting that makes sense though because then if you if you don't have the character if you don't have their motivations then how can you build a story around it really yeah i think the same i think the same yeah um sanford you were saying so you and chuck and and david you you did all your did you start with wanting to have a story set in the harlem renaissance and then build out from there or did you start with the character or the genu like was there a different part of it that you yeah um yeah, the Harlem the Harlem Renaissance was the the kind of the the seed that blossomed <clears throat> into um, what we have right now because we we started to kind of explore that that era and it was what really piqued our interest besides the era was the fact that there wasn't a whole lot out there about mm -hmm. that time period, especially from a fantastical storytelling standpoint and and that in itself, that era in itself is kind of fantastical. There's so much there, so much rich, richness and, and um, history. Like our, just if you really think about it, our, our arts culture kind of derived from that time period, you know, film and music and um, in literature. Um, a lot of the things that were influenced and in, in, in were, um, and what we are um, into um, today is from derived from that time period. So I think um, that that was the biggest thing that fascinated me. And of course, um, just thinking about kind of the cross pollination of using steampunk, um, mm -hmm. which again, um, that was a kind of a, a marriage that seemed very seamless and almost fascinating to the to the point that we didn't realize or we just started to realize that there wasn't a whole lot out there and definitely nothing like that where you had those two genres uh, crossing over and um, so we we were pretty aggressive after we kind of saw that there wasn't a mm -hmm. whole lot of things out there and it was so unique um, we can you tell the Russian story. before anybody else takes it kind of thing oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. and um, you know it's funny because even you know if I can digress you know the the historical aspects of, of it too, and kind of weaving all that in there, um, you, you're starting to see a few um, properties come about. Um, I think um, there's a new show called Lovecraft Country that's coming mm -hmm. out on HBO. Um, and we're, we're getting a lot of nods from, you know, uh, <clears throat> from uh, media and from uh, fandom. Mm -hmm that we were some of the first to, you know, kind of spark this whole, wow. you know, um, I guess it's, it's, there's this thing called Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. but now there's another uh, phrase that's uh, being coined, um, I think it's called uh, Afro-Goth, I think. It's kind of like horror. Yeah, and, yeah. so it's, um, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, again, gratifying to know that totally. we saw the opportunity to, 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 to advance this idea and um, and 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 open the door, if you will. Uh, we're yeah. not the first. So I've, I've heard we're not the first, but we definitely um, we, we're starting to allow. You know, people see what we're doing, and and it's opening up other opportunities uh, for other stories. In that, yeah, world. yeah, you acted on that opportunity of like that not really being represented yet. So right and work on it that's cool um stephanie do you also i mean you you were talking about your series that you go back to but um how how is it working with a writer do you do you like to get the script and everything in and then and then take their idea and make it bigger 
or do they give you a looser idea? Did Kieran give you like a, a play by play and then you kind of take it? The way I see it, it's uh, really a, a lot of um, trust. So Kieran give me seeds and I'm growing the flesh over it in some way. Uh, or at least I try to. And I hope that if, if I'm wrong, he will tell me. But mm -hmm. uh, usually he's okay with the thing I'm coming up with. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, um, we, we were talking about the way um, uh, things from outside influence the thing that happened in, in comic books. And for me, it has to resonate. Uh, I, I do resonate with times, and if the book also does, so maybe we have a book that can talk to the people at that time. I always thought that a good book is um, circumstantial. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the word, but yeah. uh, good books are the books that are uh, at the right time, at the right, uh, in the right place, you know. And I'm, I'm trying to, to be as much myself as I am in that time. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Like, it's, it's kind of what we were saying before, like, it's going to get wrapped up in it, but the current events, but mm -hmm. as long as you're staying true to yourself. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, in each thing that we designed for the book, there is a lot of Kieran in it and there is a lot of me. And sometimes I don't know uh, what's the most important in... <laughs> and there, there are things I think are very, very me. But when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, maybe it's really very, very Kieran too. Yeah. You know? uh, you like... I just realized we identified to the same character mm. in the book. <laughs> That's just weird. Oh, wow. Interesting. I'm kind of curious who that is. <laughs> he will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nope, he's not saying it. Have you, have you ever, I'm also curious as, a, as an artist, have you ever included something that, like, like maybe Kieran didn't exactly point this out, but you you added a, another aspect to the art and that inspired a whole other character or other like I've seen I've seen different pages where I'll see there's like a face in the window and it's never explained and it's just something that the artist decided to add into it. Has there ever been anything like that where it kind of turns into it's this a shimmer of an idea and then it kind of turns into its own character, its own plot or anything like that? Yeah, I, I think uh, I brought uh, a few things that weren't expected. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, well, that makes sense. <laughs> I was just remembering you saying, um, is it okay if I have a, a job? If I, is it okay if, if I have Angela sitting on a giant robot on this panel? <laughs> uh, and I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll, I'll work out a reason for it at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> Why not? Maybe it's just a, I don't know if it's a giant robot thing that, that artists have, but for Marla, you had mentioned, which I guess is the first mention of, of the, the new book, Ha Ha, uh, and each issue is drawn by a different artist. Issue three is drawn by the cartoonist Roger Langridge, uh, and he did his sketches for uh, the, a mime that is the main character of that book, um, of that issue. And in his sketches, he included a giant robot, like just in like a random scene. Of course, why not? And I, and I rewrote the entire issue to be about <laughs> the giant robot. I was oh, like, did I you really? I can't <laughs> not include that character. And so he became the, the central point of the entire issue. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I've, I've always yeah. been curious if that's happened, it's crazy. <laughs> I guess so if giant robots. Giant robots. I guess if we're going down that 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 rabbit hole, uh, we we did something similar to um, <clears throat> there's these little imp creatures that um, that we implemented in um, the first few issues of uh, Bitter Root, and um, we started getting. I guess th this is a little uh, a little more overt. I guess uh, we started getting 
um, letters or emails, texts or whatever from fans saying, what are these little imp creatures? I remember please them. They're something. very cute. Yeah. Please do something with these characters. And um, so we're going to do something with those characters. Oh, really? <laughs> They're kind of like little gremlins, but scarier from what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll, some, you'll, sorry. you'll see. Yeah, you'll some see. stuff that Rats were doing in that um, with Je like the scripts are incredibly over the top, and then yes. Jeff makes up a bunch more stuff. And this is like kind of how I work with Stephanie, but Ludacris is maybe even more so because it's all about the the margin jokes. And then we go back and we do back matter on the comic like if, if people have seen the first issue we've got this opening spread of the wedding and the wedding is just full of like all these berserk characters right. uh, most of which we'll never see again and then Jim at the back we annotate them so we make up a bio for each of the not all of the characters but like we do like a potted bio for all these characters and we talk about why there is a bag of wheat in this picture it's, okay. it's a sentient bag of wheat who's incredibly he's incredibly a great thinker sadly and capable of communicating with anyone else but we guarantee you this wheat is the smartest individual the world has ever seen <laughs> uh so like and then we're also doing stuff like really minor stuff in issue that jeff drew in issue one will bring back in issue four you know what i mean like that's yeah. i said you know i said earlier about ludicrous being that kind of uh, always say yes and build on the answer exactly There's a lot of that in terms of okay let's just make the marginalia that dense well because it yeah. kind of just started as like a fun project between you two yeah just like i'm just gonna keep build. this is just gonna be ludicrous it's just gonna be we're just gonna have fun with it and it's not gonna be anything really um but then it became something huge and a whole world there's probably more philosophical way there that's the sort of thing that we'll probably get to at the end but there's yeah. kind of there, there is a kind of statement in there somewhere probably mm. yeah it's kind of impossible not to to have some kind of statement um uh, another question I had about world building specifically is to you, what is the difference between like world building and the mythology that you build into your story and just like setting an era? So we have setting an era, it's kind of, it's kind of shallow, but how do you make it, how do you build it out beyond that? Um, Marco, we can start with you again. I'm trying to understand the question. I guess like Sorry. Sorry. if you if you have a you have a setting like you have Washington State and then you have the era and how do you how do you make it bigger than that? What do you think goes into building a whole world? What what are like the concrete things that you need that, for you personally that really fleshes out a world? Um, you were saying before character is a big one. Um, what what is the difference besides just like a world that exists and and just like setting and and time and a place i guess um or anybody else can jump into yeah maybe it's it's a little complicated i think uh you mean um what makes me want to build the place yeah how do you how do you want to um build it out like in or i guess in, a, in another way like how do you add uh, a unique voice to that that setting and era um because there's on the surface level uh the book could just be about um this like fantastical story set in this era in the victorian times in the state but how does it, um, how do you zoom out and kind of look at the whole world on a whole? Or, um, I don't know if it's uh, related, but I hope, I, hope. Um, I try to make uh, a lot of research, research for the world of that period, in particular, uh, the late uh, 800. Mm -hmm. Is very complicated to find because you find a lot of stuff uh, in Europe, but from uh, North America it's very complicated. I noticed uh, searching on uh, internet, uh, Google. Yeah. Well, I love Google, and <laughs> I try to make it uh, realistic, but also I try not to be too much realistic because sometimes uh, things uh, it um, is not. Um, um, it's very 
there is a lot of fantasy in some mm -hmm. way also in my comic. So I try to make uh, it realistic when uh, it deserves. And uh, sometimes I, I more about uh, artistic interpretation. I don't know how to say. Mm. And I try to make it, um, try to make, to give it um, a, a particular way of looking. Uh, Sorry, yeah. my research. No, that all makes sense. Like, it takes a lot of research. And, like, Will, I know for Ice Cream Man, it, I think it was, like, around the end of the, the first arc that we realized that there's a much bigger mythology to it. And instead of just these, like, one-shot scary stories, there's, there's the whole mythology with, with the cowboy and the Ice Cream Man. And... Did you... So, did you... Oh, go ahead. Hold on one second, because my daughter just oh, came home. So hi. She just came home, right? Hello. She, hi, can you say hi, sweetheart? Can you say hi to everybody? Hi. She was at the beach, and she's very tired. <laughs> oh, she's got the sun sleepies. So much sun. I'll see you in a little bit, okay? All right, love you. Oh. Reality of working at home. So cute. <laughs> um... You were saying uh, that at the in the first arc of Ice Cream Man, toward the end, it started to build a, a larger kind of mythology around yeah. who the Ice Cream Man was. Yeah, I'm curious about the the mythology of it. Like, how did how did you build that in? Did you see it coming? Did you have that planned out, kind of thing? Yeah, I definitely didn't uh, have it planned out, um, and I've I, I've kind of vacillated a lot as to my feelings on uh, in a book like Ice Cream Man. Um, just because of the demands are sort of different, how necessary it is to fully embrace that mythology. Um, so basically, you know, I wrote the first uh, three issues, um, which were all self-contained and just had these different sorts of, uh, now there's loud hip hop in the background. I'm sorry, this, the mm -hmm. FedEx driver is, um, is enjoying his, his afternoon route. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I wrote the first three issues. They were self-contained. And then um, I got sick uh, for a couple months with this weird thing. So I, I didn't write the fourth issue. And then the first few issues came out, um, hit stands. And a lot of people were like, oh, I can't wait to find out more about the ice cream man. Mm. Um, and not that you ever want to uh, change the course of your storytelling uh, because of the the desires or demands of, of the readership necessarily but right. um, I was trying to listen and there seemed to be something appealing to people about at least having more insight into this person that was supposed to be a background character mm. um, so I decided to you know I kind of came up with this foil for him and started to build out this mythology and then did a whole arc on that mythology um, and then realized that like I kind of dove in too deep and that like a, a book made up of one shots doesn't need to have every answer and address you know kind of every bit of history of, of its characters mm. um so I for like three four straight issues I like tried to expand this mythology and build this yeah. world as it were uh and then realized that uh, especially for my strengths as a storyteller that it was just a bad idea because I was um I was not doing it so well so I kind of went back to just this like hyper contained zoomed in mm, version got it um and I've been pretty happy there but I want to also in thinking of the end of the book I want to kind of at least lightly address um you know some lingering threads and so it's uh I, I don't know if it's the same for all books but for my book I definitely kind of go back and forth between Wanting to do service, wanting to do service to these open questions that I've I've uh, presented, and then saying, "Eh, you don't need to answer those. It's not a big deal," um, and just kind of plowing ahead. Yeah, it's probably hard not to listen to fans and and other people saying what they want, and uh, and working on that yourself and trying to be true to Although, yourself. As the requests become more and more specific, it becomes easier and easier to not listen. Mm -hmm. um, like, like I am, I am not doing that. Uh, I, I am not making an issue about a garbage can or something. But um, uh, yeah, but yeah. So it's um, 
Uh, but I, uh, to kind of go back to before about how you kind of um, expand the world, um, again, like the, because Ice Cream Man is one shots, the, the world building is kind of also has to happen within the issue. You know, each 24 pages has to be a believable, self-contained world. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, and I think, you know, Mirka says that she kind of starts with character a lot. Uh, for, for me, it's, it's language, like whether it's a narration style or a, a way that one of the characters might speak. Um, mm. The way in for me is always like the, the kind of the patter and the, the palaver between people um, and how they talk. Like that starts to open up possibilities for me. So I start with just sentences, like writing down a fun huh. sentence and starting to build around that. Um, and that's, that's my convoluted yeah. answer. No, that makes sense. That's interesting that it's language for you, but that, that kind of makes sense too, looking at the series. Um, cool. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Um, well, we're about out of time, but what I wanted to do just real quick is just hear your guys' thoughts. Um, if there's any, a new book that's out, a book that's not yours, uh, a new series that's out, or uh, a film or a TV show or something that has a world that you love. Um, I think for me, uh, I just finished Fleabag and I loved it. And it's like a very realistic world, but it's, it's so charming and it's so good. And I, and I love what Phoebe Waller-Bridge did with that. And yeah, just real quick, what is, is there any for everybody? Um, is there one particular piece of media that's really struck home with you world building wise? So I'm super late on this, but I just finished watching uh, Penny Dreadful. Oh, like, really late. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't want to watch it when I, it was a thing, but I actually saw the first few episodes of the, of the new spin-off. I was like, ah, maybe I should go back and see it. And it, it's actually delightful. I really yeah. loved it. Oh, good. Yeah, I binged that. <laughs> It's a good time for that, yeah. But the, the, the um, City of Angels, is that the, the name of the spin-off? It's really, really cool, too. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, like it's not in uh, Victorian era anymore. It's in the USA, of course. Uh, and there are some Nazis mm -hmm. um, and a lot of... Uh, it's, really, it's really a good, uh, a good show. Like, I, I really enjoy it for now. I love the actress. I don't have the name now, but uh, it's a whole thing. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I um, I think um, it's interesting. You, I'm glad you said other media because, as far as comics, because you know things are <clears throat> where they are right now. Yeah. It's not a lot of going out, but you know, of course, right. you can do a lot of online stuff. But um, I've uh, well, I have two. I can kind of diverge uh, a little. Um, I um, have uh, The Five Bloods, which is uh, the film by Spike Lee that just came out. And mm. um, super fascinating, um, super timely, um, obviously. Um, so <clears throat> that one, you know, is, again, is very riveting. But to, I guess my, if you want to call it my other kind of getaway escapism um i'm watching this show called the handsome siblings it's mm -hmm. um feudal japan uh two brothers separated at birth and one goes off and he's privileged and the other one is a street kid and mm -hmm. um the whole dichotomy of just their cultures and worlds apart and then still being this blood and how they come to cross paths and what it does to their whole um, honestly, the whole viewpoints from there moving forward. Uh, it's an action fantasy adventure on top of that. So I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, um, it's, it's fun, fun, quirky, but um, it has that underlying uh, social commentary um, built in there. And that, um, it's, uh, it's really cool. Both of those are on uh, Netflix. So yeah, definitely. Okay. The Handsome Siblings, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a chore. It's like 50 episodes. So wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> one season. I'm oh. on like 30. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. 
It's an undertaking. Worth it though. It's an undertaking. It like. Cool. Yep. Uh, Kieran, do you have one? Uh, how about? I must admit, I'm. What? Uh, just second season two of what we do in the shadows just started now. Uh, oh, yes. I'm very into it. It's just very deft. Uh, as an aging goth, I'm obviously very at home with the vampires. <laughs> um, the I, tell, I can't actually tell you the name because I don't think they've announced the name yet. But I've read the first issue of Casper's and Dan Waters' new book. Mm. Uh, I don't think they've announced the name yet. It's really good. It's got this instantly. It knows it, it's coming from a place which is clearly lived, but also mm. very different, and they found a way to make it their own. So, can't even talk about that very well. So, I just want to give a quick the Wayward Children series by Celia Maguire, which is the mm. series of novellas. Um, a, and the world building is incredibly elegant. It's, it's novellas, so they're obviously short, but she just chooses the details very precisely and has a very, and the high concept is these are children, it's basically children who went to live in an Oz type world as a kid, and then they found their way back to Earth. And then, that, but they did, found their way back by accident, and their yeah. lives have been ruined. They've been traumatized, and all the thing is that all they want to do is go back to the world where they were happy. Mm. And these are all basically these um, these kids, all in this kind of shared um, this sort of. Uh, it's got, it's got a little of that I don't want to say that kind of like Harry Potter energy because it hasn't because it's very much a, it is a book for adults. Yeah, but it's got that kind of the awful gothicness because her pro style is incredibly delicate. And she does this kind of, she does very simple classifications of the worlds, like nonsense worlds versus logic worlds, and like these different axes. And she just talks about it very precisely and also very beautifully. I cannot recommend them highly enough, wow. especially if you like die. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Mirka, do you have anything? Yeah, me, me too. As uh, Stephanie, uh, I really like uh, the Penny Dreadful. Mm, it's also sense, a yeah. inspiration uh, for for Mercy. Um, I like the atmosphere and also the main the characters are amazing in my opinion um, for example in my comics there is this old man and uh, this young woman it's like uh, also that TV show there is this couple mm -hmm. and they really like it the settings also uh, I don't know if uh, only TV shows or also movies uh, yeah. and stuff for example, um, I use it a lot as references uh, in Complete by Guillermo del Toro mm. because uh, I, I really like Guillermo del Toro aesthetic in general yeah. and uh, it's the exactly same period more or less and uh, just beautiful uh, aesthetic yeah. and inspired a lot by that also. That sounds good. That makes sense. That all checks out for mercy too yeah <laughs> what about you well um so i i'll go across a, a few mediums uh tv wise so i've been um because so much of the 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 news and everything going around us um whether it's the pandemic or everything else is it, just so uh, unnerving and, and upsetting and uh, uncertain I've been doing a lot of like comfort media yeah. you know, stuff that I've stuff that I've seen or read uh, a billion times before but are you know just because I derive some slight uh, sense of ballast from it going back to it uh, so TV wise uh, I've been rewatching all of community mm, um, I did that too it's just um, beyond it being you know kind of like a feel-good show uh, the rules of the world there are constantly changing. Um, it's just such a fascinating thing to watch the evolution of the episodes, um, you know, to, and it kind of zigs and zags between surrealism and, and down the middle, you know, consequence, action consequence, uh, drama. Um, and so that's been, uh, I've just been enjoying that. Uh, yeah. Comics wise, uh, both, uh, I, I'm, I have a lot of trouble still, right? I'm sure everybody does making these comics. And every time I finish one, I, I feel like I forget. Oh, oh no. <laughs> what does he forget? Oh, you froze well. <laughs> he this hanging. That's part um, of the building, right? He's a master yeah. of a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, that was a great cliffhanger. It froze for a second. Uh, You're good now. Uh, oh, cool. Um, yeah, I, uh, every time I, I write a new issue I feel like I've forgotten how to write an issue and um, 
reading both uh, both Ludacrat's number one and uh, Ad Adventure Man number one, um, oh, yeah, you're kind funny. of you're kind of just knocked over by the amount of detail and world that um, some of our, our our best comic writers are able to to fit into a, a finite amount of pages. Yeah. Um, you know, as someone who tends to be a little bit more minimalist, I'm just like in awe of how rich something can be so quickly. Uh, and I mm. think those are two good examples of issue, the issue ones kind of overwhelming you in a good way with yeah. this kind of new sensation and these new people and the new rules. And, um, you know, it's, it does a lot of work very quickly and that it compels you to come back for more, I think is an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, and then just uh, more comfort reading. Uh, I'm a short story guy. That's so always my preference. Um, and uh, Dennis Johnson's Jesus's Son, uh, Hemingway's In Our Time, and George Saunders' uh, Civil War Land and Bad Decline. Mm -hmm. They're all similar books of short stories in that they're all, and, they're, and they've obviously inspired Ice Cream Man, yeah. in that they're uh, disparate stories that all take place in the same world. Uh, and there are different kind of tricks that those writers use to make you believe that they're all happening in the same world. Um, so uh, for if that's your kind of world building that you like, uh, those those books are, are never never let me down. I just bought the the Civil War Land and in Sharp Decline or whatever it's called. Yeah, I don't know it who is. told me to buy it, but yeah, I just got it. Have you read Saunders before? Or no, I haven't. Is that your first? Mm -hmm. So that'll that'll be your first of uh, I guess he's got four or five books of short stories, and then his most recent one is called a novel. It's not technically a novel, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're you're in for a treat. Cool. Well, I'm gonna watch all that, and I'm gonna look at everything because what else do we have going on? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you so much, everybody, for doing our, our virtual panel. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to talk about this stuff. And yeah, hopefully we'll be doing this all in person next year. I don't know. But if not, then we'll see you all around. I'll bring the croissant. <laughs> I will eat them. I will eat them. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Cool. Stay safe.